Live from the Sands Convention Center in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Cube at AWS reInvent 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsors, Amazon and Trend Micro. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live at Amazon Web Services reInvent 2014. This is theCUBE, our flagship program, where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Valley. I'm joined by my co-host Stu Miniman from Wikibon.org. Our next guest is James Hamilton, who's Vice President and Distinguished Engineer at Amazon Web Services. Back again, second year in a row. He's a celebrity, everyone wants his autograph, selfies. I just tweeted a picture of Stu, welcome back. Thank you very much. So, I can't uh, believe this is a technology conference. So Stu's <laughs> falling over himself right now because he's so happy you're here, and we are too, because we really appreciate you taking the time to come on. I know you're super busy, you've got sessions, but always good to do a CUBE session on kind of what you're working on. Certainly, amazing progress. You don't, we were really impressed with what you guys have done over the years, last year too. But yeah. this year, the house was packed. Your talk was, very well received. Cool. Every VC that I know in enterprise is here. And they're not telling everyone. There's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on. The competitors are here, <laughs> and you're up there in a holding court. Um, talk about the future. So, quickly summarize what you talked about in your session um, uh, on the first day. What yep. was the premise? What was the talk's objective? And what was the, some of the key content? Gotcha, gotcha. Um, my, my big objective was the cloud really is fundamentally different. This is not an, another little bit of nomenclature. This is something that's fundamentally different. It's going, to, it's going to change the way our industry operates. And what I wanted to do is to step through a bunch of examples of innovations and show how this really is different from how IT has been done for years and gone by. So the data center, obviously, we're getting quotes after quotes. Obviously, we're here at the Amazon show, so the quotes tend to be skewed towards this statement, but I'm not in the data center business. Seems to be the theme. Mm -hmm. And people generally aren't in the data center business. They're doing a lot of other things. Sure. But they need data centers to run their business. Yeah. With that in mind, what are the new innovations that you see coming up that, you, that you're working on, that you have in place, that are going to be the enabler for this new data center in the cloud? So that customers yeah. can say, hey, you know, I just want to get all this you know, baggage off my back. I just want to run my business agile and effectively. Is it the, the equipment? Is it the software? Is it the chips? And what, what, are, what are you doing yeah, there from an innovation standpoint? Yeah, what I focused on this year, and I think it's a couple important areas, are, are networking, because there's big cost problems in networking, and we've done a lot of work in that area that we think is going to help customers a lot. The second one's database, because databases, it, they're complicated, they're the core of all, all applications. When applications run into trouble, um, typically it's the database at the core of it. So those are the two areas I covered, and I think that's two of the most important areas we're working right now. Yeah, so, so James, uh, you know, we, we look back into people that have tried to do this services uh, angle before. Networking has been one of the bottlenecks. I think one of the reasons yeah. why the XSPs fell to the 90s, it was networking and security, yep. you know, grid computing, uh, even to today, it's, you know, so what is Amazon fundamentally doing different today? And why now is it acceptable that you can deliver services, you know, around the world from your environment? What, what's different about networking today? It's a good question. I think it's a combination of private links between all of the regions. Every major region is privately linked today. That's better, better cost structure, better availability, lower latency. Um, scaling down to the data center level, we run all custom Amazon design gear, all custom Amazon design protocol stacks. Um, and why is that important? It's, it's, it's because the cost of networking is, is, is actually climbing well, relative to the rest of, the, of, of compute. And so we need to do that in order to get costs under control and actually continue to be able to drop costs. Second thing is um, customers need more networking, uh, more networking bandwidth per compute right now. It's, it, you know, east-west is, is the big focus of the industry. Because more bandwidth is required, um, we need to invest more fast, and that's, where the, that's why we're doing private gear. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating statistic, because it's not just bandwidth. While well, you said you do have up to, you know, 25 terabits per second <laughs> yeah. between nodes, it's yeah. latency and jitter that are hugely important, especially when you go into databases. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about, just architecturally, what, what you do with availability zones versus if I'm going to, you know, a Google or a Microsoft, you know, what, what does differentiate you? It is a little bit different. Um, the parts that are the same are um, 
every big enterprise run, that needs highly available applications is going to run those applications across multiple data centers. That's, so you, it, it, the way our system works is you choose the region to get close to your users or to get close to your customers or to be within a jurisdictional boundary. You, from down below the re region, normally what's, what's in a region is a data center and customers usually are replicating between two regions. What's different in, in, in the Amazon's solution is we have availability zones within region. Each availability zone is actually at least one data center. Because we have multiple data centers inside the same region, it enables customers to do real-time synchronous replication between those data centers. And so if they choose to, they can run multi-region replication just like most, most high-end applications do today, or they can run within an AZ synchronous replication to multiple data centers. The advantage of that is it takes a less administrative complexity when it comes, if there's a failure, um, you, you never lose a transaction. Where in multi-region replication, it has to be asynchronous because of the speed of light. Yeah, also, uh, also there's some jurisdictional benefits too, right? Say Germany, yeah. for instance, with a new Yep. Data center. Yeah, ma many customers want to keep their data in region, and, and so that's another reason why you, you don't necessarily want to replicate it out in order to get that level of redundancy. You want to have multiple data centers in region, 100% correct. Yeah, so, so how much is it that you drive your entire stack yourself that allows you to do this? I think about replication solutions. You used SRDF as an example. Yep. I, I worked with that, I worked for EMC for 10 years, and just doing you know, a two-site replication is challenging. Doing a multi-site is differently. You guys, yeah. you know, six, you know, data centers and availability zone are munching. You fundamentally have a different way of handling replication. We do. The strategy inside, in, inside Amazon is to say multi-region replication is great, but because of the latency between regions that are a long way apart and the reality of speed of light, um, you can't run synchronous. If data centers are relatively close together in the same region, the replication can be done synchronously, and, and what that means is if there's a failure anywhere, you lose no transactions. Yeah, so uh, there's, a, there's a great line you had in your session yesterday that networking has been anti-Moore's law when it right. comes to pricing. Amazon is such a big player, everybody watches what you do, you buy from the ODMs, you, you're, you're changing the supply chain. Uh, you know, yeah. what, 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 what's your vision as to where networking needs to go from, from a supply chain and equipment standpoint? Networking needs to be the same place where servers went you know, 20 years ago, and that is, um, it needs to be on a Moore's Law core curve where as, as, transistor, as we get more and more transistors on a chip, we should, get, we should get lower and lower costs in a server, we should get lower and lower costs in a network. Today an ASIC, is always a, which is the core of a router, is always around the same price. Each generation we add more ports to that and so effectively we've got a Moore's Law, Moore's Law price improvement happening where that ASIC stays the same price and we just keep adding ports. So I got to jump in and ask you about open compute. Last year you said, um, it's good, I guess, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan, but we do our own thing. Still the case? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Still the case, okay, doing your own thing and just watching open compute, which is like a maker fair for, it, for geeks. It, it, open compute's very cool. The thing is, what's happening in our industry right now is hyper-specialization. Instead of buying general purpose hardware that's good for a large number of customers, we're buying, we're buying hardware that's targeted to a specific workload, a specific service, and so, we're not, I love what happens with open compute because you can learn from it, it's, it's really good stuff, but it's not what we use. We want to target our workloads yeah. precisely. Yeah, that was actually, the title of the article I wrote from everything I learned from you last year was hyper-specialization yes. is your secret sauce. So you also said uh, earlier this week that we should watch the mobile suppliers yes. and that's where servers should be in the future. But I heard, a, somebody sent me a quote uh, from you that said that unfortunately, you know, ARM is not moving quite fast enough to keep up with where Intel's going. Where do you see, I know you're a fan of uh, some of the chip manufacturers, you know, wh where's that moving? Yeah, so when I met with Watch Arm and understand where servers are, are going, sorry, not Arm, Watch Mobile and understand where servers is going, is, you know, power became important in mobile, power becomes important in servers. Most functionality is being pulled up on chip on mobile, same thing's happening in server land. And so, uh, you're saying it's mobile's a predictor of the predictor. trends in the data center. Exactly, exactly Because right. of the challenges with the form factor. It's not uh, like the form factor, but the, the, important, the importance of power and, and, and the importance of, of, well, 
density is, is important as well. So it, it, it's, it turns out the mobile t tends to be a few years ahead, but all the same kinds of innovations that show up there, we end up finding them in service a few years later. All right, so, so, so James, uh, we've been at, at Wikibon, ha have a strong background in the storage world, and David Floyer, our CTO, said one of the biggest challenges you had with databases is they were designed to respond to disk, and therefore there were certain kind of That's locking mechanisms in place. Can you talk a little bit about what you've done at Amazon with Aurora, and why you're yeah. fundamentally changing the underlying storage for that? Yeah, Aurora, Aurora is, 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 is applying modern database technology to the new world, and the new world is SSDs at, at the base, and, and multiple availability zones available. And so if you look closely at Aurora, you'll see that the storage engine is actually spread over multiple availability zones, and um, it was mentioned in the keynote, it's a log-structured store. Log-structured stores work very, very nicely on SSDs. They're not wonderful choices on, on spinning magnetic media. So this, what we're optimized for is, is SSDs, and, and we're not running it on, on spinning disk at all. So I got to ask you about the um, questions we're seeing in the crowd. So you guys are obviously doing great on the scale side. Um, you got the availability zones, which makes a lot of sense. Certainly the Germany announcement yep. with the whole Ireland, EU, data, you know, governance thing, and also expansion is great. Um, but the government is moving faster than some enterprises. It's amazing. And so we were talking about that last night, but people out there are saying, that's great, and it's a, a private cloud. The government's implementing a private cloud. So, you know, <laughs> you agree, that's a private cloud, or is it's that a public? not a private cloud. If you see Amazon involved, it's not a private cloud. Okay. Our view of, our view of what we're good at and, and, and the advantages the cloud brings to the market are we run a very large fleet of servers in every region. Um, we provide a standard set of services in all those regions. It's, it's completely different than packaged software. Um, what, what the CIA has is another AWS region. It happens to be on their site, but it is just another AWS region, and that's the way they want it. Well, people are going to start using that against you guys, start parsing, well, if it's private, it's only them, then it's private, but you know, there's some technicalities, you're, you're clarifying that. It's um, definitely, not, definitely not a private cloud. And the reason, the reason why we're not going to get involved with, with, pri with, with doing private clouds is product software is different. It's inefficient. It's, it's, when you deliver to thousands of customers, you, you can't make some of the optimizations that we make. Because we run the same thing everywhere, um, we, we, actually can, we actually have a, a, a much more reliable product, we're innovating more quickly, we just think it's a different world. So, so, so James, you, you've talked a lot that scale fundamentally changes the way you architect and build things. Totally. Amazon's now got over a million customers, uh, and it's got you know, so many services just adding more and more. Uh, at Wikibon, uh, actually, Dave Vellante wrote a post yesterday, said that we're trying to fundamentally change the economic model for enterprise IT, yep. so that services are now like software. When Microsoft would print an extra disk, it didn't cost anything. For, for you, when you're building your environment, is, is there more you know, strain on your environment for adding that next thousand customers or that next big service, or that just do you have the substrate built uh, that's going to be able to help and grow for the future? It's a good question. It, it varies on the service, um, it, it, and usually what happens is, is at we get better we, we get better year over year over year, and what we find is once you get once you get a service to scale, like S3 is definitely at scale, then growth, I won't say it's easy, but it's, 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 it's easier to predict because you're already on a large base and we already know how to do it fairly well. Other services um, are, require a lot more thought on how to grow it and, and end up being a lot more difficult. So I got some more questions before I go into some of the personal questions I want to ask you. Uh, uh -oh. but so so um, you know, I'm looking at this booth right here, it's Netflix um, guys right there. Love that service, awesome. Um, founder, just what they do, just a great company. And I know they're a big customer. But you mentioned network. So at the Google conference uh, we went to, um, Google's got some chops. They have the developer community rocking and rolling, and then it's pretty obvious what they're doing. They're not trying to compete with Amazon because it's too much, too much work, but they're going after the front end developer, you know, Rails, whatnot, PHP, and really nailing the back end transport. You see in the peering, yeah. really going after to enable a Netflix, this next generation companies, to have the backbone and, and not be uh, relying on third party networks. So I got to ask yeah. you, so as someone who's a, a tinkerer, mechanic, if you will, of the large scale stuff, you got to get rid of that middleman on the network. What's your plans? Are you going to do peering? Um, Google's yeah. obviously telegraphing, they're coming down that road. Yeah. Do you guys meet their objective, same uh, product, better? What's your strategy? 
Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. The reason why we're running private links between, between our regions is the same reason that, that Google is. It's, it's lower cost, that's good. Um, it's, it's, it's much, much lower latency, that's really good, and it's a lot less jitter, and that's extremely important. And so it's, it's um, private links, peering, customers direct connecting, that's all the reality of a modern cloud. And you see that, do you have to build that in? Almost like you want to build your own chips. I'd imagine on the mobile side with the phone, we, you, know, you can see that everyone's building their own chips. You got to have your own network stuff. Yep. Is that where you guys see the most improvement on the network side, getting down to, the, down to that precise, hyper, specialized? We're not doing our own chips today and we don't, in the, in the, in, in the um, networking world, and we don't see that as being a requirement. Um, what we do see as a requirement is we're buying our own ASICs, we're, we're, doing our own, we're, doing our, we're doing our own designs, we're building our own protocol stack. Um, that's delivering great value and that is what's deployed, you know, private networking is deployed in all, of our, in all of our data centers now. Yeah, I mean, James, I wonder, you must look at Google, they do have an impressive network, they've got the undersea cables, is there anything you, that, that you look at them and saying we need to uh, you know, move forward and, and catch up to them on certain, in certain pieces of the network? I don't think so. I think when you look at any of the big providers, they're all mature enough that they're doing, at that level, I think what we do has to be kind of similar. If, if private links are a better solution, then we're all going to do it. I mean, yeah. it makes a lot of sense, because it, you know, deep packet inspection, you know, throttling traffic, that just creates uncertainty. So that, I'm a big fan, obviously, that yep. direction. All right, now personal question. So, <laughs> um, in talking to your wife last night, and getting to know you over the years here, um, and Stu is obviously a big fan. This is a huge new generation of, of, of engineers coming into the market. Open Compute, I bring that up because it's such a great initiative. You guys obviously have your own business reasons to do your own stuff, I get that. But there's a whole new culture of engineering coming out. A new homebrew computer club is out there forming right now. My young son makes his own machines, yeah. assembling stuff. So you're an inspiration to that whole group. So I would like you to share um, just some commentary to this new generation. What to do, how to approach things, uh, yeah. how you, what you've learned. How do you come up uh, on top of failure? How do you resolve that? How do you always grow? So share some personal perspective. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I know you're humble, but you know. <laughs> a, you know. Interesting question. I think, I think being curious is, 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 is the most important thing possible. If anybody ever gets an opportunity to meet somebody that's the top of any business, a, a heart surgeon, a um, jet engine designer, an auto mechanic, anyone that's at the top of their business is always worth, is always worth meeting because you can always learn from them. One of the cool things that's, that, that I find with my job is because it's, it spans so many different areas, it's amazing how often I'll pick up a tidbit one day talking to an expert sailor and the next day be able to apply that tidbit or that idea um, solving problems in the cloud. So just don't look for your narrow focus. Totally. Your advice is talk to people who are pros yeah. in, in whatever their field anyway. is. Yeah. And yeah, it's always uh, a James, James, a friend of mine. Uh, Stay curious. Uh, Steve Toddy actually called that Venn diagram innovation, where you need to find all of those different pieces because you're never know, going to know where you find next idea. Yep. So for, for, for the networking guys, you know, there, there's a huge army of CCIEs out there. Yep. Uh, some have predicted that if you have the, the title administrator in your name, that you, know, you might be out of a job in five years. Uh, what, what, what do you recommend? What should they be training on? What, what should they be uh, working for to, to move forward to this new world? The history of computing is one of the level of abstraction going up. Um, no, never have all, never have the, has it been the case those jobs go away. The only, the only people that will, that the only time jobs have ever gone away is when someone stated a level of abstraction that wasn't, that just wasn't really where the focus is. Um, we need people taking care of systems. As the abstraction level goes up, there's still complexity, and 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 so my my recommendation is keep learning. Just keep learning. All right, so I got to ask you the big picture now. Ecosystems out here, or, um, Oracle, IBM, these big incumbents are looking at Amazon, scratching their heads saying, it's hard for us to change our business to compete. Obviously you guys are pretty clear in your positioning. What's next, outside of the current situation? What, what, what do you look at that needs to be built out besides the network that you see coming around the corner? And you don't have to reveal any secrets, just philosophically, what's your vision there? I think our strategy is maybe a little, it definitely a little bit different from some of the existing old school providers. Um, one is everyone's kind of used to Amazon passes on value to customers. We, 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 tend to, we tend to be always hunting and innovating and trying to lower costs and passing on the value to customers. That's one thing. Second one is choice. Um, 
I personally um, choose to run my SQL because I like the product, I think it's very good value. Some of our customers want to run Oracle, some of our customers want to run MySQL, and we're absolutely fine doing, uh, fine doing that. Some people want to run SQL Server. And so the things that kind of differentiate us is um, enterprise software hasn't dropped prices ever, and that's just the way we work. Um, enterprise software is not about choice. We're all about choice. And so I think those are the two big differences, and I think those ones might last. Yeah, and that's, that's a good way to look at that. Now back to the, the IT guy, let's talk about the CIO. Scratching his head saying, okay, I got this facilities budget. And it's kind of the, I, I talked to one CIO, he says, I spend more times in planning meetings around facilities, power, and cooling than anything else on, on innovation. So they have challenges there. So what's your advice to someone who's been through a lot of engineering, a lot of large scale, to that team of people on power and cooling, to really kind of go the next level, besides just saying, okay, throw some pods out there, or, or whatnot. What's, what, what should they be doing? What's their roadmap? You mean the roadmap for doing a better job of running their facilities? Yeah, well there's always pressure for density, and sure. power is, is a sacred, yeah. sacred resource right now. I mean, power yeah. is everything. Power is the new oil, so power sure. is driving everything. So, mm -hmm. they have to optimize for that, but you can generate more power. Sure, sure, sure. In space, so they want smaller spaces yeah. and more efficiency. The, bigger, the biggest gains that are happening right now and the biggest innovations that have been happening over the last five years in, in data centers is um, mostly around mechanical systems and driving down, and driving down the cost of cooling. And, and so that's, that's one hot area. Uh, second, second one is, if you look closely at servers, you'll see that um, as density goes up, the, the complexity and difficulty of cooling them goes up. Um, and so getting designs that are, that, are, that are optimized for running at higher temperatures and certified for higher temperatures is, is, a, is another good step and, and we do both. Yeah, so James, there's such a diverse ecosystem here. I wonder if you've had a chance to look around. Anything cool outside of what Amazon's doing, whether it's a partner, or some startup, or uh, some interesting idea that's caught your attention at the show? Yeah, yeah. yeah in fact, I was meeting with Western, with, um, pardon me, Hitachi Data Systems about three days ago, and they were describing um, some work that was done by Cycle Computing, and several hundred thousand yeah, cores. We've had cycle computing oh, on. You, on oh, yeah. wow. Is this last, last year, we yeah. no, he's here too. Oh, we got him on. So okay. Tashi is just showing me some of, what they, some of what they gained from this work, and then he showed me this bill, and it was 5,600 and some dollars for running this phenomenally big, multi hundred thousand core project. Blew me away. I think that's phenomenal. Just phenomenal work. James, I really appreciate you coming in. Stu and I are really glad that you took the time to spend cool. with our audience and, and, and come on theCUBE. Again, great pleasurable conversation, very knowledgeable. Stay curious um, and get those nuggets of information and, and keep us informed. Come, thanks for coming on theCUBE. James Hamilton, distinguished engineer at Amazon, doing some great work. And again, the future's all about making it smaller, faster, cheaper, and passing those costs. You guys have a great strategy. A lot of your fans are here, customers and other engineers. So thanks for spending the time. This is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with Stu Miniman. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>